Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Grow Live with Katie here at Homestead Gardens. I am your host, Katie Dubow, and today's Monday. Yep, it must be our Houseplant Heroes Day. Every The last Monday of every week, we have a wonderful houseplant guest on. And today, I am going to bring in my guest, Leslie Halleck, and introduce her all to you. Leslie and one of her little friends. Who's that you have? Uh, Jiggles just creeped in. I'm I'm at my home uh, library today, not the office. So there may be a couple of chihuahuas that sort of decide to get in on the action. Nobody is upset <laughs> my, about that. My pandemic puppies. I adopted two chihuahuas um, over the past year. Two little black chihuahuas. This one's Jiggles. The other one's Jojo. So yeah, they like to hang out with their peeps. So here we of are. Of course today. they do. <laughs> and you love to adopt. We Homestead loves pets. We everyone who's watching probably loves pets. So you tend to adopt senior dogs yes. or special needs dogs, right? Uh, yeah, older, mostly female chihuahuas. A lot of times, you know, they get used very heavily for breeding and then they get dumped. Um, and both of these were dumped. One of mine was found on the side of the road, oh. severely injured, a lot of trauma, you know, so we, I take in some of the older gals that, you know, don't have a home or maybe have some problems, have health problems. It's harder, you know, chihuahuas and pit bulls are always the the ones most left at the shelter or abandoned. And um, so, and it's tough to rehome seniors, but I, I adore them. So we just have a running cycle, a running doorway <laughs> of, of chihuahuas. There's, we have three right now. So it's, it's oh my gotta goodness. Have yeah. I love yeah. Well, if you follow Leslie on Instagram, which um, it, I always get your business. What's your Instagram handle? It's Leslie Halleck Leslie at Leslie Halleck. Halleck. Yeah. Instagram is at Leslie Halleck. Twitter is at Leslie Halleck. Facebook is Halleck Horticultural. Yes. So yeah. you will see lots of great pictures of plants, indoor, outdoor. Yeah. You posted a picture of a cute little tree frog yesterday um, and chihuahua. So follow for all the love. <laughs> yeah. I try not to um, do too many chihuahua pics because I know people expect plants. Um, and I do, you know, I cycle. I'm an everything is horticulturist. You know, I grow everything everywhere, outdoors and indoors. I'm an intensive vegetable gardener. I'm an intensive ornamental gardener. I love my bulbs and roses and perennials. Um, and then obviously an intensive indoor gardener. So I do kind of everything. It makes it a little tough for me to decide what to post yeah. on on my Instagram feed or other social media because I do so many different things. But, you know, um, my books have tended to focus, on, you know, on indoor growing and, and propagation and then upcoming tiny plants. So, yeah, I po I've been posting a lot of indoor stuff, but you know, I grow everything everywhere. So I, I, but I'll try not to overload everybody with the chihuahuas. <laughs> we don't mind. Um, but that's what we're here to talk about today is houseplants yeah. indoor. But if you do have questions, if you happen to be tuning in and you have questions about something that's also outdoor, right. throw, it, throw it away. I mean, throw it in. Um, we'll absolutely ask, answer. Leslie will try to answer your questions as best as she can. And of course, at Homestead, they are happy to answer your questions too. So we're here to just help. Um, we're focused on houseplants. We're going to learn a few things about houseplants today from Leslie, but we're here to help. So please fire away any questions that you have. So let's jump in. Leslie and I have known each other for years. She is an author of many, many books. Uh, like she said, lots focused on light. She has a degree in interior lighting and knows a lot about horticulture. And so she's written a number of books to help us. And you have a new one coming out in June called Tiny Plants, which of course is a huge trend. So yeah. yes, such a big trend. And you've been posting a lot of cute pictures of tiny plants on social media. Yes. And, and so tiny plants discover the the joys of growing and collecting itty bitty house plants. That's the new book. Um, I will say it was already supposed to be out in March. So I know if any of you are watching and you've already pre-ordered, which I um, just thank you so much and, and so much appreciate that, are waiting patiently or impatiently. I do not expect any patience from anybody. The <laughs> pandemic has delayed this. So it looks like um, end of end of May, uh, 1st of June is when it's gonna come out. It's gonna be here. But yeah, I, so, you know, I kind of like to decide what trends are going to be <laughs> sometimes. And I have been obsessed with tiny plants, itty bitty house plants, itty bitty plants in nature for many, many years since I was doing research, uh, rainforest research back in the mid 90s and started discovering itty bitty tiny uh, micro orchids. It kind of set me off down this path. So in addition to all of my other gardening hobbies, 
itty bitty plant species and tiny house plants um, are kind of a personal obsession of mine. And luckily, Quarto indulged me in 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 publishing this book specifically. I just wanted to introduce you know, all the new plant parents out there and experienced plant keepers as well, who've never, you know, taken a dive into this world of really tiny plant species. There's a whole new level of collecting that you can do with yeah. really cool plants that you just may not have, um, you know, discovered before. And, you know, when your aeroids are sort of, you know, uh, taking over your space, you know, now that everybody's kind of collected their top 10 easy indoor yes. village house plants or are doing that and you want to grow beyond that into something a little bit more unusual, but maybe don't have a lot of space. That's, that's where tiny plants can, can help you out. I totally agree because you can see, obviously we've got the big plant trend covered, but when you look behind Leslie, I have two plants behind me. Right. One, two, three. I'm looking behind you. Four. Oh, I've got five. a bunch. Right. It's and a this ton. Is this is just a sprinkling. I mean, I have them all over my house. The cool thing about tiny plants is that, you know, there's lots of great new low profile under the counter bookshelf grow yes. lights out now um, that allow you to grow and display lots of little plants in spaces you would normally be able to keep plants. And so I do a lot of that. And I do a lot of growing under glass um, with mm -hmm. tiny plants, which is a great way if if you are growing high humidity species, but maybe you don't want to get into the technicalities of planting terrariums, which is a little more complicated. Yeah. And, you know, you have to have um, enough artificial lighting over the whole, you know, terrarium to really accommodate everything you're growing. But I just like to use the cool thing about tiny, tiny plants and tiny vessels is, you know, you can grow and display individual plant species, you know, just in any sort of little glass jar you have. I do a lot of micro syningia. You can see this one is blooming inside the oh glass jar in a gosh. pot. So I do tons of little potted plants inside glass jars, you know, for humidity. And so that allows you to just sort of display things. Um, isn't that cute? That's Beautiful. a micro syningia. Um, you know, all over, um, you know, windows so wise, this is a really cool little creeping button fern. Mm -hmm. um, two and a half inch pot. Um, ferns can be really challenging for a lot of plant keepers, but this one in particular, creeping button fern is actually quite tolerant of low humidity inside. And like, this is the perfect little desk plant that you can tuck onto a shelf or the corner of your desk. I mean, there's a million, there's, I cover so many um, yes. plants in the book, but, but yeah, so you can tuck them all over and display them and decorate with them in ways that it's tough to do with your bigger plants that sort of have to sit where they are all the time. You can't just really move them around all the time. And at some point we have to get you to Homestead because they have this whole new houseplant section, awesome. houseplant haven, and a focus on tiny plants, which I know they'll display your book right there when Fabulous. it is out because it is such a, a trend and it enables people to maybe get more in their collection because we know how expensive some of these bigger plants can be. You right. get the pot, the soil, and the plant, and that gets upwards of, you know, in the hundreds of dollars. And so not that tiny plants are inexpensive just because they're small, right? right? Doesn't mean they're inexpensive. But well, clearly, so I, I like to say everything in scale. And that's the cool thing about tiny gardening, micro gardening and, and, and growing tiny plants is that obviously the inputs and resources um, for each plant. I mean, clearly, you don't need as much potting soil. You don't need as much water. You don't need as yeah. much fertilizer. The pot is tiny. Um, you can get as expensive and fancy as you want to with in, with teeny tiny plants or you can go really really simple so i mean this is this is a little um uh echeveria i think chia chihuahua insis um and a, just a little cheap little terracotta pot that probably costs i don't know 20 cents or something like yeah. that i just painted it and it's so easy it i barely ever water it it does stay under artificial grow lighting to get enough light which many succulents need or you can get a little bit trickier um, I have lots of cool little handmade glazed pots. Um, yeah, that one's really pretty. And that's a little hard to find micro syningia. Look how cute that is. So cute. It's hard to get my camera angle. Um, I know. Yeah. So, you know, obviously a little handmade pot's going to cost you more than a, than a simple terracotta pot. But um, it also feeds my addiction for hunting for vintage glass vessels. I mean, you can see like my mushrooms are, are particularly a favorite of mine. I love all the glass mushroom jars. And I have this cool little itty bitty teeny tiny paparomia growing in this little kind of wine vintage wine glass little terrarium. <gasps> Look, I mean, so yeah, I mean, you can get it as fun. You know, but it's great because you can do a lot of vintage shopping. But yes, overall resources 
tiny space. So you can grow hundreds of different plant species yes. in a few square, couple of square feet of space, yeah. which you can't do that with your bigger foliage plants. So if you're into collecting and you love plant species, tiny plants is a great way to sort of in, indulge and grow your plant collecting habit in a much, much smaller footprint of space. But talk to me about yeah. drainage. Do you yeah. care about drainage tools in your larger plants as well? Or you're not, because it obviously it seems like none of those vessels they all have, have drainage. drainage. Well, the they vessels do. don't. The pots, like, so for example, many of the pots that I have sitting inside that are high humidity, you know, all of these little pots have drainage holes. So that's a great way to manage that. You pot your little specimen into a planter with a drainage hole, and then you set it inside a glass vessel or under a closed jar to keep up the Got humidity. It. Then you kind of get the both, 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 best of both worlds. You know, when you build planted terrariums, you do have to be very careful about creating the right type of drainage layer, um, have enough light, and then you've got different species growing together, which don't always have the same water yes. light requirements. Yes. And that's where some terrariums can get a little tricky and some things die out. So I, I kind of for me it's specimen collecting so i usually have one particular little plant in each glass vessel if they're high humidity plants obviously the windowsill plants you know are, are sitting out in this container has a little drainage hole in it okay. so you know it's going to go um drainage is always recommended now for some plants that are what we call hemiepiphytic, semi-epiphytic, um, like many little begonias or little philodendrons, this is a, a little tiny, tiny philodendron. Let's see if I can get you a good shot of that. You can see those little aerial roots on it. Yeah. Great. It's got a terrestrial root system, but because they're epiphytic, this is just growing in moss. So mm -hmm. you have to get to know the species of plant. For many of your house plants, if they're semi-epiphytic or epiphytic, you can, with practice, grow them in vessels without drainage holes if you're using the right media on their high humidity species. So they don't really need a soil substrate mm -hmm. to grow a terrestrial root system. So you, it all comes down to learning about the species of plant you're growing and how it grows in its natural environment. And that will help guide you as to how to care for it in an artificial setting. Yeah. But drainage yeah. is, is important, um, but a lot of the little teeny tiny hemiepiphytic or epiphytic species can be grown just on moss, on moist moss, which is exactly what this little philodendron mm -hmm. is doing. It's mm -hmm. just growing on moss. Um, you know, same with some of the little tiny begonias, um, some of the little ferns, you know, so you just have to you have to do a little bit of research into each plant to figure out how how they grow and what kind of conditions they're used to. And can we identify issues with tiny plants faster because they'll show us faster because they're smaller or are the issues pretty much similar? You're going to see aphids just as quickly as you would on a bigger plant. Um, some things will be very similar. So when it comes to care and maintenance, some things with tiny plants are going to be very similar to your larger house plants. Some things will be very different. So uh, clearly a very, very tiny span plant species may react much more quickly to something like over fertilization. Mm -hmm. You could, you know, you might burn that plant just immediately. Um, or if it's a tiny plant that's sitting out on a windowsill that needs regular watering and you forget to water it, obviously that plant may go down a lot faster than a bigger plant species. You know, you have you have tiny plants in a small volume of, of growing media. So when you have tiny pots and tiny plants, you may water more frequently, just in much smaller yeah. volumes, yeah. right? But but they may require more frequent watering than a plant that's got a larger soil volume. Conversely, put a plant under glass with high humidity and you hardly have to water it very often at all. So you could accidentally overwater some of those plants. And, and yes, pests tend to sort of show up at the kind of the same rate, but for all of my plants under glass, that's rarely an issue. Right, plants out on the windowsill that are sort of commuting yeah. with other plants and passive air exchange that's coming in and out of the house, which is how a lot of your pests, you know, come in, yeah. are obviously a little bit more susceptible to that. So, you know, I guess you may have to react a little more quickly, but I tend to dote over my small plants sort of as a daily wellness practice more so than I do over my bigger house plants. Professional horticulturists, I think, have a bad habit of sort of, um, it's survival of the fittest. Like with their big house and office plants, it's set it and forget it. And whoever survives while well, we're paying attention to other things. Yes. But my teeny tiny plants, I tend to, like, I want to look at them every day. I want to see what's going on. I want to check on them. So I tend to dote on them. A little well, bit. and that's probably even, I think, the general consumer, too, not just the professional horticulturists. I think as horticulturists, yes, the, the cobbler's 
children yes. have no shoes. Yes, but exactly. I also think people with our larger plants, high maintenance is out. You know, we can't really take high right. maintenance. And then these lower little, I mean, Deb is saying how cute they are. Totally. You want to pay more attention to them. Yes. And, yes. you know, what we're seeing for next year, even with trends, is this artisanal, this micro, this this small batch of things. And so a lot of times with these smaller plants, you're looking at putting them in that little hand painted pot and the right. uniqueness of it rather than, um, you know, kind of the idea of mass produced. You just get another big plant off the <laughs> right. conveyor belt, which we know is not how they are made. You know, they're grown and they're grown with care, larger plants as well. But there is some sort of like uh, unusual quality about a smaller plant that I feel like is is more right. makes it more rare and more special. Well, so it comes down to aesthetics for a lot of people, and that's why a lot of new plant parents are collecting house plants, right? It's about form, right, and how their form adds to the aesthetics and the ambiance of your living space, right? We've all mm -hmm. been cooped up for more than a year, and that's yeah. why plants have really become so much more an integral part of everyone's day-to-day -day lives. Um, and so aesthetics are a big part of that. So if you're really into that and you're into decor and you're into sort of how nature can augment and visually improve your space, um, you can get way into, as you can see with all of my little vessels and there's lots of ways to do things. Um, yeah, it, it sort of takes botanical styling to a whole different mm. level and you know you can decorate your table with these and then put them back that's the cool thing about tiny plants is that you can move them around for temporary periods of time much more easily and then put them back under their appropriate light conditions like these will all move they'll go back to their you know windows or other places and then i have other plants i keep on these lower light shelves more regularly um but yeah i think that as far as i'm concerned if you have one plant in one pot you're gardening I have yes. a very, I have a very broad definition of what the hobby of gardening is. You know, the profession of horticulture is very different, right? But the hobby of gardening can really be encompassed in something as simple as this, you yeah. know, and if you don't have a lot of space, if you don't have a yard, um, if you have a small space, an apartment, or just in, I have a big home, but it's very dark. So mm -hmm. I really can't maintain a lot of large foliage plants in my house without a lot of artificial lighting. So mm -hmm. tiny plants are a great solution for me to be able to bring a lot of nature into my very dark home mm -hmm. because I have a lot more flexibility about how where I can fit the plants. Uh, it's much easier to use some of the smaller, lower powered LED lights that don't really get the job done for bigger house plants or edibles for that matter. Right. So there's there's lower inputs across the board for all of your smaller houseplant species. So for anyone who is, you know, maybe a little intimidated by the bigger houseplants or just doesn't have a lot of window space or a lot of light, but you want to collect. Small houseplants are, are kind of an amazing new world um, aesthetically and from a care and maintenance perspective, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, Lindsay is saying it's a good message that one plant makes you a gardener. I know that that yeah. term, the research shows that term is not so popular, but I think that it's changing. I think that that's changed over the last couple of years. It doesn't have the older connotation anymore. Well, you know, I think it's so interesting, um, the associations we all make with monikers, with labels and names. And just as within trends, popularity of certain terms come and go. And, you know, I think, I think when it comes to the hobby of gardening, again, there's so many different definitions of what that means for people. Um, again, a, a profession and a job in horticulture is much more distinct, you know, and, and it has a lot of labels that come with them that are a little bit more meaningful. I think when you, when you're gardening as a hobbyist, you know, I mean, you have a lot more flexibility. And I think, I think that, I think the name gardener with this resurgence in love of plants and gardening is of course going to come back around. Yes. Um, you know, I, I, it's always been strange to me. I, I've been in love with plants and gardening since I was a tiny tot. Um, so sort of the idea that I'm just going to say this, what people are thinking that gardening is for old people. Um, and what's wrong with being an old person, we could all, we should all be so lucky. I mean, you know, like that's, you know, youth comes with exuberance and energy and age brings you wisdom and experience and knowledge. And I just think that we have to blend all of that together. And, um, 
when it comes to gardening, define yourself how you want to be defined. If you're just growing a few houseplants, you're gardening indoors. You're a gardener. If you're growing roses outside, you're a rose gardener. If you're growing yeah. edibles, you're edible gardener. Um, I think that's why sort of the terms plant parent, you know, which I used for my last book, plant parenting. Actually, it's right there. I see it. I can't. The cameras are backwards, so I don't know which way I'm pointing. There we go. Um, you know, have evolved because I think a new wave of enthusiasts is trying to self-identify in their own way yeah. Yeah. with their love of plants. And I, again. I'm an everythingist. I'm very open-minded about all this stuff. Call yourself what you want to call yourself. Yes. Yes. You know, as long as you're growing everybody. something. And it looks yes. like Arthur is growing tiny Tislandias. So yes. um, I have a bunch of those myself. So I feel like everyone loves Tislandias. Um, do you have tips for growing? He says stick anywhere with light. Are there any low light? Are you know micro plants of the same? species of low light plants or are they all kind of going to be these highlight varieties you have a variety of size with tillandsias just like you have every anything else i mean there are some very tiny species of tillandsia so you can yeah you can sort of garden on a micro scale with tillandsia and then, then there's some quite large ones i should i should have brought some of my bigger i have some really big ones too so you can yeah there's scale um options there too with tillandsia so yeah if you really don't want to deal with any growing media be it soil or moss Tillandsias are a great option. They're air plants. Tillandsias are air plants. You don't actually need any growing media. And you can get really creative with sort of the vessels you hang them in and you display them. Um, but yes, they all need light. So you can risk, you know, a Tillandsia going to mush on you in a low light location, just like anything else. But um, it, you, because they're so small, you can hang them and tuck them in a lot of other places where you may not be able to fit a standard pothos or, you know, Sansevieria or something like that. Yeah. So tiny Tillandsias are also great. I actually don't go into Tillandsias in my book, Tiny Plants, because there are lots of other books about Tillandsias yeah. specifically already out there. And I felt like my job with Tiny Plants was to really introduce people to a lot of more unusual new plants that they had never seen before or had access to or didn't realize were options for them. So I don't go into Tillandsias and tiny plants, but I think I kind of refer to them somewhere, you know, that there's just so many, there's so much good information out there already. Yeah, about there is. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, so with watering your tiny plants, do you like with Tillandsias, I feel like you people miss them or they'll soak them. Sure. Do yeah. you mist with tiny plants in your terrarium or are you like top watering, bottom watering? Yeah, it all depends on the plant species. So one thing to remember in terms of watering techniques is obviously tiny plants, tiny pots. Um, so I usually use little squirt bottles to water my tiny plants. So um, obviously you try to wa water a, you know, a, a one inch pot or two inch pot with a regular watering can, you're just going to have water everywhere. So yeah. I use little um, squirt bottles to oh gosh, water you have most. tiny tools? Yes, they're tiny. Yes, I have actually tons of tiny. Look. I'm giving everybody an excuse with this book, Tiny Plants, to go tiny with whatever they want to do. It's a whole, you, I have tiny tools, um, tiny mist, tiny waterers, tiny everything, um, tiny pottery. And that's the thing, is it, is it handmade pottery is having a big moment right now mm -hmm. too, and mm -hmm. small plant pottery. So there's tons of really cool tiny plant mm -hmm. pottery. But bottom watering, is appropriate for certain species of plants. Or if you have a pot that's got growing media that's become what we call hydrophobic, it's not absorbing, water's not sticking anymore. So bottom watering can be a good solution for that. However, it's easy to forget plants sitting in water and there's some species that won't tolerate that. Um, also, if you're fertilizing, remember that soluble salts can build up hmm. in your potting media, especially if you're using synthetic um, fertilizers. So what top watering does actually offers you a little bit of leaching. When you top water, it will drain some of those, you know, when you get that salt crusty buildup in your pots, that's toxic salt buildup from the soluble salts in your tap water or along with the fertilizer that you put in. So always and only bottom watering, you know, when you have a tiny pot, guess what's going to happen a lot faster in a tiny pot? Those salts are going to build up. Yep right, to a higher concentration a lot faster. So sometimes bottom watering is a good way. It's also a way to oxygenate the roots. When you run water, you know, 
through the top of the pot, you're also helping to potentially, uh, you know, oxygenate a little bit, which is why things like your moth orchids. Um, I don't bottom water my moth orchids that are, you know, I top water those. I let water run over the roots so that they are also getting a little oxygenation. There. Interesting. So misting, there are some plants, misting your plants out that, that live in open culture, you know, out on a windowsill. Misting around a plant isn't going to do a whole lot. Okay, let's let's be honest here. Um, it's not going to do much to change the, you know, relative humidity around that plant for any length of time. Um, what you really end up doing more with tiny plants when you're misting them is actually watering them. You're getting a substantial amount of water onto the foliage or hitting those aerial roots, you know, that are along the vine. So when I water this plant, this little philodendron here, and you can see the little aerial roots growing yeah. there. Yeah. So when I water it, I, I might use my mister and just mist a little bit on this plant directly. And then I just close the vessel again. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really misting the air. I'm actually watering it. And I, I go into water quality and water techniques um, pretty extensively in the plant because there's a there's a whole chapter, a pretty substantial chapter on care and maintenance because um, water quality can also be a big, bigger issue for tiny plants. And They're I feel like that's been a big conversation yeah. lately, filtered or not. So right. I love right. that you go into that. Yeah, I go into that. I use rainwater. I collect a lot of rainwater and I use mostly rainwater for most of my tiny plants, especially sensitive uh, micro orchids, um, tiny carnivorous plants like pygmy sundews, which I'm obsessed with, which are about the size of your fingertip. Um, always use rainwater. Uh, for many of my, my micro syningias, the little tiny gisneriads, the little bloomers that I showed you, my little you know, precious philodendrons, I use all rainwater, which is essentially naturally distilled water. That's what rainwater is. Or you can use RO, reverse osmosis or, or purified water. If your tap water is not high in soluble salts or other chemical additives, then it can generally serve fairly well for the rest of your, your plant species and most succulents and things like that. But it's good to check your water check the city report. There's some simple tools you can get online, usually with aquarium supplies that you can use to check your parts per million of soluble salts in your tap water and figure out whether your city adds chloramine or chloride um, or chlorine to the water to decide wow. whether you need to use a, a dechlorinator or not. So tiny plants can be a little more sensitive. Um, so and there are certain larger foliage plants too. You know, dracaenas are particularly sensitive to fluoride that's in tap water. Um, so it's all about getting to know the species you're growing to figure out sort of what kind of What's water and how yeah. you're going to water. Yes. For any of my high humidity species that really would need something like misting, I put them under glass. I cover them with a cloche. I put them in a wardian case. I put them in a glass yeah. cookie jar. Yeah. Solves your problem. Yeah. Well, we got, we're getting two bigger houseplant question. So okay, let's start sure. talking about those. Um, and I've never done this, but I'm going to show okay. it on the screen and see what that cool. looks like. Oh, Jen Fisher asks, um, okay. what's up with the tiny, yes. so we're talking pests, tiny flies yeah. or tiny pests in yeah. her houseplants, not just tiny plants. Yeah. Those are fungus gnats. So when you have little tiny black flies that are kind of flying around your houseplants, those are fungus gnats. And, and what they do is they lay eggs in the soil, right? And then that larva hatches in the soil. And um, if you have enough of them, they can actually do some damage to your plants because the larva feed on root tissue mm -hmm. in your plants. The adult flyers are not doing any damage. They're not doing anything but annoying you. And you, they usually <laughs> happen. Good, yeah, they usually happen in areas with low air circulation because they don't like wind movement. It allows them to stagnate around a plant when there's not good air movement. And, and of course, they're, they're going to come in on any plants you buy you know, if you buy a new plant, maybe there's some egg or some larva already in that plant and then they hatch out and then the adults fly. So fungus gnats, um, I love yellow sticky traps. Those are a great solution. They're just a little yellow card that's sticky on both sides. You can hang that near your plant. It will catch all those adults and keep them from, from laying eggs, laying you eggs. Yes. Um, and then I also uh, talk about this in my book. I actually um, there's a couple of different treatments you can use for the soil. I find a kind of one to 10, 10% 10 of a 3% hydrogen peroxide mix is a water drench into the pots is a great solution. You can also use products like Thuricide, BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a natural soil-borne bacteria. You mix that with water, 
water it into your plants, and that bacterium actually um, attacks, well, is ingested by and disrupts gut function and other things like that of larva. So that can help you cut down on the larva that's in your pot. So awesome. there's a number of different solutions, but essentially what you're dealing with is fungus gnats, which we all deal with. with yes, we do. Yeah. What do you, when you say water drench, what exactly does that mean? That means like actually watering the soil. So okay. you you mix the product or solution, yes. whatever it is yes. that you're mixing, and you just go ahead and you water the soil with it, growing media. You may not actually have soil. It may be inert soilless media, right? Whatever your plant is potted into, you drench the root zone Got it. of the plant. Got it. I was picturing like one of those wine bottle waterers. I don't oh, know. Oh, no, why. no. Yeah. No, just mix <laughs> it in a watering can or whatever it is oh. you're watering with. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hope that helped, um, Jen, with that question. <laughs> Next question is from Jenny, and she's looking at her fiddle leaf fig, and she's asking, and this is one thing that Leslie, and we'll talk a little bit about her course, but propagation, I feel like, is your Excuse me. main, yep. you are so good at teaching us about propagation. And so she's asking about her figs getting out of control. So <laughs> let's pull this up here. Congratulations. Jenny saying, yep. How, one long stem. So she's yeah. asking about how to cut it. And first, how does she cut it? And then talk to us a little bit about propagation. Sure. You know, uh, fiddle leaf figs need a high quantity of light. And most of the time, most of us don't actually have enough light in our homes to really have, you know, fiddle leaf figs thrive. So they can get a little leggy and stretchy. And that often happens. You'll get one leader that just gets like really tall and, and leggy. Um, you can cut it back wherever you want it to branch out. So you can cut a couple of nodes off. You can you can take a six inch section or you could cut it in half. You can really get as dramatic as you want. So I would look at your stem, decide where you would like to see those new lateral branches come out because what will happen is when you deadhead it, when you cut it off, it, you're doing what we call relieving apical dominance. And that's going to trigger little lateral buds that are sitting dormant along those nodes on the stem to start to grow. That's a hormone response. So they'll start to grow. So go back to whatever node you would like to see your fiddly fig branch out from and cut that back. If that leaves you with a four foot section of stem, then you could actually cut that into several pieces, about a foot each of new cuttings. One will be a tip mm -hmm. cutting at the very top right? And then you'll be left with several leaf bud cuttings, we call them. So, you know, you don't want to go too big with a cutting because there's no roots on that cutting. So it's tough for that section of tissue to maintain those big leaves when there's no roots, when it's just trying to pull water in through that cut stem. So usually for fiddle leaf figs, I try not to go any bigger than two to three nodes, you know, which okay. might be up to about a foot um, section of that. And then you can root those a couple of different ways. Some folks just water root them. You can stick them in bases with water um, and, and allow them to root. Sometimes you can struggle with that cutting rotting before it roots in water. You can also use sphagnum moss um, is a great uh, tool. So pots filled with moist sphagnum moss is a great way to root those. You have to keep them moist all the time. Can't let them dry out. So yeah, I mean, that's sort of the easiest. I would use a root stimulator on fiddly figs because it's such a big section of tissue. It's such a big cutting. So if you're using water to root them, then use a liquid rooting hormone, not, not root stimulator, a rooting hormone. You can buy mm -hmm. those in liquid, powder, and gel form. If you put that cutting into something like sphagnum moss or core, cocoa fiber, core is a great product for rooting um, and is used as a hydroponic substrate. Use a gel that you just dip the end, end into. And I go into that in plant parenting. So if you want to dive into all the different types of vegetative cuttings and how-tos, you can... <laughs> plant parenting. <laughs> you can check that out. And I actually have tons of photographs that show you exactly how to do that. And I think I've got some fiddly fig cuttings in there too. 
Awesome. And we'll post a link of where you can get that book um, just in a second. But I love that. That's such that's so incredibly helpful because I know a lot of people. Yeah, I am clearly sitting in a really sunny room, which is why my yes. thing loves it here. I don't move it. I try not to touch it. I'll rotate it you know, every <laughs> right, now right. and again. But that's it. And uh, yes, I deal with fungus gnats sometimes. And, you know, like we all do, like Leslie said, but I also have a really highlight room. So maybe, Jenny, one of the tips, if you're yeah. if you are getting that leggy um section think about where you're putting it to make sure when it does grow back that it's a little bit denser maybe it's going to be healthier maybe you have a sunnier spot you can put it in is there leslie is there a way to tell like are the leaves going to be further apart the nodes if it's stretching yes. to reach the light yeah so so plants have a lot of different responses to light quantity and light quality, right? The the amount, the quantity of light photons influences plant growth and development, as does the color of light, mm -hmm. the different color spectrums, they trigger mm -hmm. different things. So in lower light locations, especially inside a house, um, you're gonna have lower light quantity than you have outside. And you're also going to have um, often less blue light, which helps you control internode length and keeps plants denser and shorter. So they start to stretch the internode length. So you have nodes here. Let me some nodes. So between each section here where these little leaf pairs are is a node, right? And that's where you'll have lateral bud tissue that is waiting that if I snipped the end of this off, I would relieve apical dominance and then I would get little side branches that would come out, right? And in between the leaf sets is the node and in lower light conditions, they tend to get longer, mm -hmm. they'll elongate. In higher light conditions, they're shorter. And that's both a, a reaction to the amount of light and the color of light. So plants are reaching by elongating that inner node. They're trying to get their leaves closer to the light source, it, the quantity and, and color of light spectrum that influences that. So mm -hmm. yes, if they're getting leggy and that inner node length is increasing, that's a signal to you that your plant is probably not getting enough light. Yep. Great, great tip. Um, Terry is saying that so she recently heard back to the fungus gnats that mm -hmm. steel wool will keep them from nesting. Have you heard about that or is that kind of a urban legend? So there are there are actually some products out on the market too that are supposed to be used as a top dressing that sort of are meant to just physically block the adults from being able to get to the soil. So all that is, is, is really just another form of barrier. Um, I've tried a few different things with varying levels of success mm -hmm. that can sometimes help prevent um, by creating a physical barrier. But then you also have to realize that sometimes when you pile up a bunch of that stuff on the surface, um, you're also covering up the feeder roots of that plant, which are absorbing mm -hmm. oxygen, mm -hmm. right? You're cutting down on water evaporation. So you could be creating some problems for that plant. If it's a plant that needs to dry out a little bit more between waterings, or, you know, you inadvertently cover up too much of the crown with whatever top dressing you're putting on that plant, be it moss, be it rock will be whatever it is, sometimes that can cause problems. So sometimes you trade one problem for a new problem with some of those. But I mean, I'm all about experimentation, so you can certainly try it. But my experience is that if you have fungus gnats, there's always one that's going to find its way down to the soil level, and then you've still got the problem. Right, and now you're so, trapping them in there, and they'll all, like, once you move, remove that steel wool, maybe a whole family will fly Yeah, out, so, so it, it's one of those things that's basically, a, it's, it's acting as a soil barrier, hmm. which there are a lot of different things that you can, can use to do that same thing. Okay, great. Well, I think let's say I like your idea of being open minded to trying new things. But sure. I think I might have busted that myth. Um, let's talk a little bit in the last couple of minutes, unless you guys have any more questions, but about bringing plants outside. Now, Homestead's in Maryland, so many people, it's warm enough to bring our plants outside or just maybe almost. I think the next 10 days look like there's, you know, in the maybe 40s. Leslie's in Texas, so she doesn't know what we're talking <laughs> we're about. Almost, but. It's like summer I'm already now. We're, <laughs> yeah, is gone. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, so many people start to bring their plants outside now. Is that something you're a fan of? Is the indoor outdoor or do you keep all your plants inside? 
You know, it depends on where you are and your weather. And I'll give Maryland a shout out. I um, I was born in D.C. I'm an Army brat, so I've lived all over. Born in D.C., lived in Silver Springs, Maryland when I was little. Went to Oakland Terrace Elementary School. So wow. anybody there? Cool. Yeah. Um, and so I, my mom gardened a lot in Maryland. So I, I remember the lovely weather. And um, yeah, I think that if you have a lot of potted plants that you tend to bring in for the winter, and they're obviously getting lower light levels inside and they may get a little shaggy and they may lose some leaves, then yes, putting them back outside, you know, for the growing season where they can be refreshed and cleaned mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. watered and get more light. That's great. But house plants are called house plants for a reason. So no one is under any obligation to take all their house plants outside. I think, you know, when people start gardening, they're new gardeners or new indoor plant keepers, you know, it's very easy to get attached to these things that are called rules. And you think you're supposed to do things. And so you follow those rules or or you follow things you see on social media, you know, by other amateur gardeners. And you think, okay, that's what I'm supposed to be doing, but you don't have to. So 99% of my houseplants are inside year round, right? Because that's the whole point. I'm growing them in my house because I want them in here. Now, if something has a pest problem or a disease problem immediately outside if the weather is conducive to the plant not getting frozen right or or whatever so if there's a pest issue i immediately put outside because a lot of times the pest issue can be resolved simply by putting the plant outside in higher wind circulation and with natural predators right mealybugs aphids you know which can just sort of pop up in the middle of winter i had a huge aphid infestation break out on one of my hoyas um, in the middle of winter, this plant's been inside forever. Who knows where these aphids even came from, but it's got to go. It's got to get away yes. from the rest of the plants outside. Yes. So for me, for me, you know, I have a few larger tropicals that, again, I just don't have enough light inside. So they sort of limp through the winter indoors and we'll go back outside. It's whatever you want to do. It's wherever you want to keep them. There is no rule about whether you have to move plants outside. There, there is no, you know, you don't have to repot plants in just spring. That's not a rule. You don't have to move plants outside in spring. That's not a rule. You can do- Don't water every week, once a week on the same no, day. There is no, there is no watering rule. There are no watering rules for houseplants. Not really. Each species has its own need, but that species, depending on the type of container you have it in. Is it porous container? Is it a sealed container? What kind of growing media do you have it in? Is it well-drained? Is it not? Is there a drainage hole? How much light? Light influences water more than anything else, Mm -hmm. really. So how much Mm -hmm. light a plant is getting is going to change how quickly it uses that water or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So that's going to change watering. So you and I can have the exact same species of plant in our house and take care of it in completely different ways. There are general guidelines about how much light a particular species needs to grow, of what kind of feeder it is. And all of those things are based on how it grows in their natural environment right. and you trying to mimic that. But yeah, do what you want. Move them out, keep them in. Um, if they've gotten really dusty inside and over the winter, take them out, hose them off, give them a nice shower, clean them up, move them back in. Do what you want, do whatever you want. I love that. Giving us the power, you yes. can be empowered to choose what you want to do. <laughs> Try it this year and see if your plants like it or see yeah. if you like it. You may miss them inside right. or it may give you a chance to dust off your windowsills a little bit or, you know, lay something down. Some I yeah. love, I've been doing that removable wallpaper on a lot of oh, my yeah. windowsills. Yeah. Also kind of as a protectant because I'm a messy waterer, but um, I love that. No rules and test and learn and see what works best for you. Leslie gives you the permission. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's a great for spring cleaning. Cause again, if you do crowd up the house in winter with plants, it can get a little messy, right? So yeah. it's, 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 it can be necessary, but again, you know, obviously with as many plants as I keep under glass, I have no need to do that. No, these never make a mess anywhere. So nope. they don't need to get moved. I just wipe down the, the glass. I do more glass cleaning yes. <laughs> than, than anything else. Arthur's saying he likes keeping them inside too because they're his decoration. And so right. we are now using our, it's like taking a picture off the wall. What right. what do you do now? So right. I totally agree. Well, and I see a lot of, again, and, and, so, and I will say that, you know, social media has propagated a lot of these things. There's so much out there now on social media by so many people. 
and so many blog posts telling you do this now, do this now, do this now. And, you know, when I teach my course, which we should talk about before I leave my indoor plants course for UCLA, you know, one of the things I drove my students, I think a little bit crazy with, but then they learned why is I'm going to, there's foundational science for everything, but then I'm always going to say to you, but it depends, but it depends. It depends on so many other factors. And so, right. Um, just because you're seeing a flurry of blog posts out there saying time to move your houseplants outside doesn't mean it's time for you to move your houseplants outside. It just means if you have a reason to move your houseplants outside yes. and the weather is conducive where you are. But it's so interesting because so many of this, so much of this content out there isn't relevant to people where they live. Exactly. Gardening is local. Gardening yes. is local. It's like zip code local. So, you know, a lot of the information that's out there getting circulated is not I'm in Dallas, Relevant. Texas, is not useful for gardeners. Like we're on a completely different schedule. So you also have to know where you are, what the weather's like. And when you're seeing all of these posts, either, you know, like don't plant your tomatoes yet, don't plant your tomatoes. And I'm like, wow, we're already, we're heading towards our second planting of tomatoes here soon. If you wait till now, you will not have tomatoes. So it's all relative to where you are, where you live, what your climate is like, and what your personal plant keeping habits are. Love that. Great tip. And that's why we love Homestead Gardens, because if you can drive there, likely they're having the same conditions as you are. So you right. can ask them about the, the right tips. Your local garden center is a great resource. Right. Exactly. So is Leslie's yeah. course. Yeah. Let's talk about your course. Um, your UCI, you did it for the first time this year, right? It was all online. And... You, you knocked it out of the park. Your students loved it. Uh, even if you follow Leslie on social media, one of her students did this oh my gosh. of her. That was amazing. So um, you're doing it again. So it opens in June, yep. right? So the enrollment opens now. Today, so we can it, sign yeah, up. Yeah. 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 Enrollment. So if it, it's UCLA extension, uh, horticulture, gardening, landscape, architecture, and design. This is the, the the department it's offered in. So obviously students going to UCLA and whatever their programs are can take that as an elective or if they are a horticulture certificate student, because UCLA also has a horticulture certificate program, the course is part of that, but it's open as a continuing education class to anyone who wants to take it. It's 11 weeks. Um, the winter quarter, you know, I, I record lots of lectures and videos and I have a ton of information and then we do a weekly live class. Um, and it's, it's 11 weeks long. So we get way into all things, light science, artificial lighting, um, pests and diseases, humidity, temperature, you name it. And we've got some projects that we do. I make you buy plants for the class. So that's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible that you have to buy oh, classes. Oh, I didn't plants. This, the summer quarter. So the class starts June 22nd, but enrollment open today. So you can go register. Um, this quarter, I'm not requiring everybody to, to do the weekly online live class. We made it right. so that it was really more online versus hybridized. So you can do everything okay. just online, but I will be online every week, every Tuesday evening for whoever wants to come join class, awesome. which you should, because it's totally fun anyway. And it's a great yeah, way to meet new plant friends. Yeah. yeah, totally. And, and quite frankly, there's a lot of questions you're going to have and that I'm going to need to answer for you in person. Right. So it's really a better learning experience if you join the weekly live zoom class. Very cool. Well, we posted more info about it and the link cool. so you can register now. Don't go away yet. We have a couple more questions, Leslie. Yep. If you have sure, some whatever. time. Yeah, I do. Um, let's, let's roll. Bindu says help. So I don't know if millipedes are actually what she's seeing. Okay. So um, maybe you can diagnose this and help her out. Yeah, she may very well, especially if you move your plants in and out out of doors. Sure. So if you're yep. setting your house plants outdoors, then obviously you're creating habitat for a whole host of insects that may not otherwise be in plants that are indoors in inner growing media all the time that never go outside. So once you put your plants outside, ants, centipedes, roaches, you name it, yeah, can move into those pots. They're really lovely habitats for insects. And sometimes, you know, you can pick up a pot. We have fire ants here in Texas and you pick up a pot and realize the whole planter has been populated with a nest. So yes, if you move your pots in and out, you very well could have hmm. an outdoor insect that has taken up residence in your pots. So back outside, <laughs> this would be a situation back outside. I hate ever recommending really strong 
um, broad spectrum insecticides. You know, I, I try to do everything as naturally as I can, but I'm also a professional horticulturist and there are some situations where a, a true pesticide or insecticide or herbicide is required. It should really just only be used when it's really necessary and you should always try to use the lowest impact product that you need to get the job done. If an insecticidal soap will do the job, like for aphids, don't use, you know, I don't even think malathion's on the market anymore, but you know, don't use a heavy duty chemical. You don't need to, it's not necessary and you kill a lot of other beneficial insects potentially um, with it. So something like that, you could do an insecticidal soap like as a soil drench, you could water that into the soil of the pot. That would be something to to try. And I'm sure Homestead's got a lot of products for that, um, a lot of products online that can be recommended for that. You don't need a systemic insecticide for something like that because clearly these are just insects that are living in the soil media. So an insecticidal soap drench, something like that is probably all you need to do. Sometimes just like a heavy running of water, right, through the pot will, will rush off anybody who you don't want there. Great, yeah. Bindi, I have. I hope that helped um, with your question about millipedes. And I think that would knock out other pests maybe that yes, are in there as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah, potentially. All right, now way back, I wanted to save Deb's question because it was okay. more of an outdoor question about crepe myrtles. I don't know yep. what your knowledge we are crepe, is. We are a crepe myrtle country here in Texas. I know, so. so yeah, and saying, they're just, they're not quite in flower yet, but usually they hit about June. They start, to, and then they'll bloom yeah. the whole rest of the year. Well, yeah. same with us. And that's why, Deb, if you're still with us, if you're letting us know where you live, because I think people think their crepe myrtle should be blooming earlier. And so I think that's one of the biggest issues is people think they're dead and then all of a sudden they bloom. So I'm not sure. So she's saying that you guys can see the question here. It does not look like it has new buds or growth, which might just be because of where she lives. Do you have any other tips? I, I probably have to ask her a few more questions. Number one, how large is this um, specimen of crepe myrtle? Because there are many varieties of crepe myrtle, some growing a foot tall up to 40 feet yeah. tall, right? So what, what type of crepe myrtle does she have? And does she live in a climate where they always all die completely back down to the ground and only come back from the root zone? Because I believe that they're, most are cold hardy to about zone seven, maybe six-ish B, but once you start to get colder, they don't, you don't always keep all the top growth on them. Um, so I kind of have to know where she is and how, what kind of crepe myrtle she has. But if she's saying the upper portions of the stem, so I'm assuming she's got some stem growth. Most of what you see that looks dead are really just this the inflorescence, the dead seed flower and seed stems from the previous year. And frankly, that's the only thing that ever really needs to get pruned off crepe myrtles to clean them up and have them be happy, healthy bloomers rather than what we call crepe murdering, which is where you top them, you yes. know, because you think it's going to make them bloom more. It doesn't, but it can cause a lot of other structural issues, plus really ruin the lovely form of the bark. So it's probably that um, there could potentially be a little bit of cold damage or what you could be seeing is just a lot of the dead inflorescence and seed stems from last year. Yep. And that's what can be cleaned up. They normally don't start blooming until it gets really warm. So, yeah. you know, it may be June. They're summer bloomers. They're not spring bloomers. So they really don't start blooming until you get into summer. Um, yeah. So um, you might not even be seeing flower buds yet. So that's totally normal. If you're not seeing any leaf buds, you know, that again, if it was cold a little later where you are, they could just be a little slower coming out. They're always slower to emerge than everybody expects them to be, but they could probably use a little cleanup, get off the old dead seed heads from the previous year and then give it some time. And then depending on where you are, maybe there could be possibly some cold damage or, or, and that that would need to be pruned out. But yeah, if they Deb's just in made Maryland, out yet. yeah, yeah, and she's in Maryland. I'm guessing seven okay. B. So I'm sure that it is. We did have an ab. I mean, I know you had an yes. abnormally cold winter too. <laughs> yeah. um, we had. I don't want to complain. We had an abnormally cold winter, so it, it's possible there is cold damage, like Leslie said. But it's I'd say possible. Deb, just give it some time. Right. Um, and the right. tip I want to reiterate Leslie's tip about we do not need to cut them back. You you guys can picture the trees that are looks like stubs, just a light prune for our crepe myrtles. Right. So. Right. Wonderful. Some some people when they grow, like you can grow some of the smaller crepe myrtles as a hedge. So some of the varieties that grow under that 10 foot range and some people, depending on where you live, 
if you want to prune them back and keep them smaller, they may cut them all the way down to the ground every year and just let, just have the, the fleshy new growth. You know, there's yeah. a lot of different cultural ways that you can manipulate plant growth. There's some appropriate ways and then some ways that just make things worse, which is yes. topping crepe myrtles is totally unnecessary. Pruning out dead growth, cross branches, removing the old seed heads from the previous year. Those are appropriate pruning tasks for your crepe myrtles. Well, that is a great yeah. note. Give if it a little no time. More questions about crepe myrtles or house plants. Um, remember, Leslie's book comes out in June, but she's got a bunch of other books, Gardening Under Lights, Plant Parenting. I know I missed one. There's one more. Uh, there's Gardening Under Lights. Uh, the ones yes. that are, that are most important would be Gardening Under Lights. And that's all about how the science of light, how, how plants use it, everything artificial lighting. You just leave a little math in there. So if anybody wants to geek out a little bit on some science, gardening under lights is for you. And then plant parenting, which is all about propagation. Um, tons of photographs. So if you want step-by-step -step instructions on how to propagate just about everything, seeds and vegetative, it's actually great if you've got kids. The way that I laid plant parenting out is that there's so many pictures for you to follow that if you want to do some projects with kids on propagating, that's actually a, a good book. And then, of course, Tiny plants. Yes. Um, uh, discover the joys of growing and collecting itty bitty house plants will be out any day. Hopefully, you can please go pre order it if you want it on Amazon. I, I will say that um, it does help us authors out when you pre order on Amazon. Um, it really helps authors and, and the publishers kind of figure out demand for the book. So if you're willing to wait a couple more weeks, feel free to pre-order that on Amazon. And um, and then hopefully after that, it'll be everywhere. All, all they'll yes. all be where books yes. are sold. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And reviews help too, right? Don't reviews help of your books Ab on Amazon? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Reviews help on Amazon and Goodreads. If you're on Goodreads, that's a good place as well. Cool. Yeah, cool. and always appreciate it. So thanks. Thanks yeah. in advance. And thanks if you already have reviewed one of my other books or bought one of my other books. I, I appreciate you so much. Oh, well, and we appreciate you. We thank you so much for your time. This was so helpful. We had so many great questions. Thank you guys out there for asking them. And we hope you have success growing. Pick up one of Leslie's books, go to Homestead, ask your questions. Remember, gardening is local, whether, you know, even with house plants, because your light yes. condition, it's local down to your house. Like Leslie yeah, said, the humidity really in her is. house yeah. is different than the humidity in my yeah. house. So um, don't worry. We've all killed plants. So try again and happy growing. Leslie, we thank you so much for your time. This was so thanks. much fun and so good to see you. Yeah, as always, thanks. And and everybody, um, yeah, have fun experimenting, grow what you love. If it doesn't work the first time, you know, I always tell people, as a horticulturist, I've killed way more plants than you ever will. You'll never catch up to me. That's how it goes. You learn how to grow things by killing it. So never get discouraged. Just, you know, try again or try something new. Love it. Thanks, Leslie. All right, have a great day. Bye-bye. And I'll be back next Monday. We're going to have Homestead's own Heather Wheatley because we kick off um, Garden for Wildlife Month. It is May 1st. The whole, the whole month of May is Garden for Wildlife Month. So please come back here on May 3rd with Homestead's own Heather Wheatley to talk about their native habitat center and all the wonder wonderful things that Homestead is doing. That's May 3rd at noon Eastern. We'll see you then. Thanks so much, everybody.